Thank you everyone for being here. We have a pretty big group today. We're really lucky to have y'all. Um, I'm Kate Averett. I'm the outreach manager at the Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center. Uh, we're in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, we are the only museum in the world dedicated to the history of Black Mountain College. Um, and Ruth Asawa herself was a student at Black Mountain College and it was a very formative experience for her as we'll you know, be exploring today. Um, this is one of our virtual programs, which is presented as part of our museum from home. Um, so we have taken a lot of our offerings virtual and um, are very happy to be able to do that free of charge. Uh, we're a small museum, um, but we've been able to kind of uh, be led on our feet and um, be able to reach a lot of you as we've seen who are around the globe, um, which is very exciting for us. Um, so if you wanna learn more about us, um, our website is blackmountaincollege.org and you can visit our museum from homepage to catch up on previous performances and programs that we've had um, throughout this season and then going into the future. Uh, so our speaker today is Jason Barker. Uh, Jason is a PhD student in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford University. His research examines American art and literature, especially in relation to critical race theory and the histories of science and romanticism. His first peer-reviewed article, Ruth Asawa's Early Wire Sculptures and the Biology of Equity, appears in the spring 2020 issue of American Art. It argues that the artist's biomorphic sculptures engage mid-century biological science and its expanding rhetoric against racial hierarchies. From 2011 to 2016, he was a founder and director of the Hansel and Gretel Picture Garden and Pocket Utopia, a critically acclaimed gallery and performance venue in New York which collaborated with many institutions, including Robert Wilson's Watermill Center and the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, Jason is currently writing his dissertation on the artist Charles Birchfield. So I will turn things over to Jason uh, for um, his presentation. And um, during that time, you're welcome to pose any questions that you have into the chat. And following the presentation, uh, we will go through um, those questions and try to answer as many as we can. Um, and you're welcome to pose your own question once I have prompted you to unmute yourself. But in the meantime, we'd appreciate if you would keep your, uh, your, yourselves muted. Um, but I think for now, we'll hand things over to Jason for his presentation. Thank you all for being here. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Kate. And um, thank you to Kate and thank you to Alice uh, Seabrill for the opportunity to speak about um, Asawa's work. And um, without further ado, I'm just going to get right into it. I'll share my screen with all of you. Okay. Can everybody see? Yeah, that's great. Can. Okay. Um, in 1949, on the wooded campus of Black Mountain College, the American artist Ruth Asawa made this, a small woven wire sculpture. It has two conjoined lemon-shaped lobes hanging together one above the other, suspended from the ceiling. They are connected only by a tube tugged between them. With its evocative silhouette, its wire mesh form seems to ask us to see more than pure abstraction. Instead, at just 16 by four by four inches, it seems like a strange wire model, like a version of something else, as if reduced or enlarged to scale. In other words, it beckons us to imagine what it is. And because the sculpture is always installed, hanging from the ceiling, swaying gently in currents of the air, it seems to quiver or move on its own, like a living creature. But if this trembling wire sculpture models life, what life form is it? Well, at first blush, the sculpture fails to answer the question. The biomorphic work could be way too many characters in the world of biology, right? What exactly is its polysemous anatomy? If 
it were two heads, it would be sans eyes, sans mouths, sans noses, yet there are so many orifices evoked by the holes and the wire loops like a sea sponge. What if the sculpture is a hollow bag of skin, utter surface with no innards, a chainmail snake skin, an evolved shell, a bio armor. Noting the shape of the lobes, they might evoke the bulging of a plump bicep. Look again, and these two lobes pulling apart are a suspended, like long, long drip of viscous slime, snot, two beads of algae, a drip of two drips forever dripping. But all these contradictions in the imagination of seeing the sculpture as so many biological creatures modeled in the material of metal, it ends up perhaps that that's not a contradiction at all. Asawa's personal papers seem to show that indeed this sculpture represents cells the fundamental building blocks of all forms of life. Truly, every microbe, every plant, every sea creature, every animal, every human being is made of this thing, the cell. As such, by pointing to this microscopic particle underlying all life, a solid sculpture might suggest a radical universalism. If so, this universalism at the cellular level might suggest a transcendence from the categories of plants and animals and the racial categories of humans. At the level of biography, the transcendence from racial categories vis-a-vis -vis the cell is significant. Asawa had suffered internment at rower camp in rural Arkansas shortly before arriving to the campus of Black Mountain in 1946. And defying the violence of internment and of such racial categorization, Asawa began to identify as a universal being, at least by the year 1948. In 1948, um, she wrote a letter to her future spouse, the architect Albert Lanier, quote, she wrote, I no longer identify myself as a Japanese or American, but instead as a citizen of the universe. I no longer want to nurse such wounds. I want to wrap fingers cut by aluminum shavings and hands scratched by wire. Only these two things produce tolerable pains. At Black Mountain, in her little studio fashioned from a small army barrack, Asawa ruminated about biology and race, and she seemed to find a philosophy for her art. In 1949, the year she made this sculpture and her final year at Black Mountain, Asawa studied the processes of cell division in a biology class. And one of her mentors, Joseph Albers, described her artworks as biological. In the same year, on her final examination on, quote, the science of the development of the human race, Asawa typed a nearly translucent typewriter paper, quote, this science is based on research, discoveries of skulls, human matter, and a standardized text, test the cephalic index to classify the different racial types to prove that one race is neither more or less intelligent, that the imbecile has the largest brain presently playing a role in proving equal racial intelligence, Asawa wrote. In other words, Asawa estimated biological parts like the skull, the brain, and perhaps the cells she had studied that year in class to be evidence of racial equality. Asawa's interest in biology blossomed in her first term at Black Mountain. 
In the summer of 1946, during a class taught by the artist Jean Varda, who taught art theories with biological words like nucleus and plasma, um, Asawa collected four zoological engravings from the Encyclopedia Lodonensis. And she preserved these four engravings in her archive for 70 years. They're beautiful, and this is one of them. They include portrayals of corals and um, the overhead view of a starfish. The engraving of the starfish, which is now on the screen, suggests a basket seen in an aerial perspective with its tentacles twisting and interlacing like a curly mesh into a circular form. Asawa's attraction to this engraving with its pictured starfish, also known as a basket fish, foreshadows a significant change in Asawa's earliest wire sculptures, a change from basket to biological form. On a school field trip to Toluca, Mexico in the summer of 1947, Asawa saw villagers crocheting wire into egg baskets and she learned the technique. At first, the, she thumbed wire into rows of loops that row upon row, she coiled into these small baskets with short flaring necks, like this one um, that's actually in the collection of the Asheville Museum. But within two years, Asawa had closed these simple baskets, morphing them into hanging wire lobes that I argue are derived from the diagrams of cells she studied in her Black Mountain biology class. The cell imagery that she studied appeared right at the very outset of Asawa's sculptural endeavors when she encountered two profusely illustrated science textbooks, visual resources that she likely incorporated into her sculptural practice. In 1946, just before she arrived at Black Mountain, she was enrolled in a zoology course and she made um, an ink drawing of the eye of a mollusk, which you can see here on the screen. She copied this diagram from a textbook called The Invertebrata. But zooming in further to the level of the cell, the same textbook, the Invertebrata, contains an illustration. Um, here it's on the left. It pictures a cell in the process of undergoing binary fission. It's the leftmost diagram. The cell's two lemon-like lobes are pulling away from each other in the process of twinning, connected only by an attenuated, fragile thread of ink. Asawa made several pencil drawings as well related to this textbook diagram in 1949 from a different um, biology textbook called Zoology, um, The Science of Animal Life, which was assigned in her Black Mountain biology class. And on this slide, you can see that she copied the diagram captioned protozoa um, and amoeba fission. And it also shows a similar cell undergoing binary fission. So as you can see, the artist's breakthrough 1949 sculpture on the far right, which is her earliest surviving closed sculpture, appears to be derived from these textbook diagrams. Our by now familiar sculpture's two hanging lobes seem to, de to depict the two textbooks illustrations of twinning cells connected by their respective attenuated strands. If so, Modeling such cells in the exemplary moment of dividing and copying their genetic material, Asawa's sculpture could gesture to a world of universal particles, the proliferating cells and molecules that mid-century biology actually viewed as evidence of the fundamental equality of all human beings. So for example, just one year after Asawa made this breakthrough sculpture, the United Nations Educational and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, of course, um, issued their famous Statement on Race, which was published in 1950. 
the statement on race proclaimed on the world stage that genes and dividing cells were scientific proof of racial equality. UNESCO's statement on race, however, did not altogether abandon the race concept. Um, instead, it problematically continued to like, classify people into other categories um, like the Caucasoid, the Mongoloid, etc. So it actually just rehashed archetypal racial categories. But despite this, um, the UNESCO statement on race, which circulated in 1950, just after the conclusion of World War II, was meant as an international unified avowal against the scourge of Nazi eugenics. So the UNESCO statement on race was an attempt to convince a public that molecular biology could finally confirm the fundamental constitutive equality of humans, and specifically as a rejoinder to the There's like international celebration of the UNESCO statement on race, and here the UNESCO's own courier paper announces the importance of this new um, claim of racial equality at the biological level. Um, the front page, as you can see, reads, fallacies of racism exposed. So returning to Asawa, um, in her Black Mountain College biology notebook, um, Asawa seems to have envisioned molecular biology as a response to Nazi eugenics. In fact, she juxtaposed her biology illustrations with Nazi imageries, imagery. And, uh, you know, of course, please, please note the warning. Upside down, against the orientation of biology diagrams, like this one on the left, Asawa wrote in ink the word Hitler in repeated block letters. And on another page, she drew tumbling swastikas, seen here on the right. Perhaps at mid-century, such was the rhetorical and visual power of molecular biology that Asawa could position cells precisely against Nazi eugenics, poetically laying out two opposites on the paper of her notebook the tragedies that resulted from the Nazis' racist ideologies versus the hope of racial equality provided by biology. In a word, death versus life. Drawings of cells sandwiched between the marbleized covers of Asawa's biology notebook seem to prefigure many of her earliest wire sculptures. In the upper left quadrant of one pencil drawing labeled unicellular organism is a grouping of overlapping plant cells. Each one is rendered as a circle and filled in with tight curls. Perhaps the larger circle represents an older cell known as the parent cell in biology and the four smaller circles represent its corresponding daughter cells. As if Asawa drew the one larger cell as it burst into five. The form of this drawing is akin to a later sculpture, untitled from 1957, which is now on the screen, that also has differently sized overlapping orbs bubbling away from each other as if parent cells are begetting their young. Another biology notebook drawing labeled colorless plant yeast represents four groupings of yeast cells as ovals attached to smaller ovals. Each oval has a double border that Asawa pummeled with little pencil marks, implying cell walls that encircle a gleaming nuclear material. Every grouping of attached yeasts is, assigned, is aligned in succession like a chain. The label buds marked here with like a little gray slash blue arrow, denotes that the drawing depicts budding, which is the process by which yeast reproduces itself. The topmost rendering on the page, for instance, which I've observed to here, is one yeast cell in the process of budding a daughter cell, who in turn has budded another daughter cell. 
the illustration to me seems like a conceptual antecedent for many of Asawa's wire sculptures. For instance, Untitled from 1952, which is pictured here on the right with eight lobes budding out of each other in a vertical formation, but with that same chain-like structure. All the lobes in the sculpture, all the daughter cells as it were, are still conjoined. They're still frozen in that fleeting moment in which they remain a single form before separating into eight. If so, budding, binary fission or mitosis would be the defining action of this sculpture. It would seem to show a forever ongoing copying of genetic material. This signification relies on the tube of wire mesh tugged between each of the eight lobes, a form found in nearly all of Asawa's sculptures made between 1950 and 1960. If this eight lobe sculpture, for instance, represents a parent cell and seven successive daughter cells, then the tubes between the lobes would be really important. They would suggest a continued connection despite the implied impending dislocation of each lobe parting from the next. In other words, connecting each orb, these delicate tubes might even suggest the origin of the word mitosis from the Greek mitos, which means thread, implying a stitch that binds these parting cells in unison. So the thread, the mitos that joins, unites cells as one complex. Each woven tube between the cells in this sculpture would be the link, the stitch conveying that each cell has been given life from the genes of its parent. And there are important tubes. You can imagine these tubes in Asawa's sculpture uh, imply like a thread or binding of the genetic material that is stretched along from parent to daughter cell. So if so, Asawa's wire crocheting technique might help to further this idea. Her wire weaving itself could allude to the helical structure of DNA and also to the process by which DNA is unwound and then rewound into a new strand. So the wire thread from which all of Asawa's sculptures were made can be seen here in the lower left corner of the image of the artist working on the table. And you can see the, the wire coil, it's, it starts as a large, the wire thread starts as a large coil in an almost helical configuration. It's as if Asawa's wire sculptures that she's making were born from this unraveling supply of genomic material, old DNA that Asawa then crocheted or re-looped into tiny rows of sideways double helices like new DNA. Some of Asawa's sculptures may allude to another evolutionarily universal form. For example, each hollow crocheted wire lobe might seem like what is known as a blastula. Asawa's Black Mountain College Biology Notebook te and textbook describes, or her Black Mountain College Biology textbook, as Winchester Zoology, describes the blastula as an early version of an embryo formed when cells themselves um, arrange into like a ball and leave a cavity within. Many of the artist's sculptures could be imagined in that vein as embryos or as blastula um, in, these very, in this very early stage of development. For example, a 1954 sculpture untitled, which is pictured here on the screen, um, has its smallest innermost sphere nestled um, within four larger spheres, which are each more ovular than its container. 
such sculptures were often labeled by the artist as, quote, continuous woven wire, end quote, meaning that the sculpture's inner and outer lobes are all attached to each other, connected by a single strand of wire that holds each of those spheres to the next as it floats within the other, connected, you might say, like an egg white to its yolk. Perhaps the sculpture alludes to that most basic structure of all embryos, yolk and white, that structure common to all the supposed races in the kingdom of Animalia, when they are all at the earliest moments of corporeal growth. As if presiding over the proliferation of her own version of nature, Asawa churned out these biomorphic forms and soon her sculptures began to suggest invertebrates. For example, one also 1954 sculpture untitled, which is pictured here, has bodies that are curling up as if poised to like paddle down heavy seawater and so propel itself up in an upward float. In Asawa's textbook, The Invertebrata, an illustration of a sea lily, an invertebrate believed to be over 500 million years old, portrays a similar form with plush tentacles that seem to swell up or down much like a jellyfish in the same way that this lively sculpture appears to be beyond seawater. Another work pictured here on the right, untitled from 1962, is made of copper wire that's now greened by age. An effect that I see like an algae film that when combined with the sculpture's form might recall one of the earliest evolutionary ancestors whirling out of seawaters onto sand like this photograph of a sparkling man of war, Asawa's sculpture suggests a gem from the early epochs of evolution when the sea creature breached the waters to live on the land, bending in broad swooping transitions from convexity to concavity. The sculpture's contours suggest the furling and cupping forms of an engraving that Asawa had collected at Black Mountain College, pictured here on the left. But I think, you know, exceeding the movement of the corals in the engraving, Asawa's sculpture actually seems to open and shut its brim-like wire wings in self-propulsion, evoking primordial wings batting or quivering in the early oceans. The sculpture represents a titan of early evolution. Not simply abstractions that can be likened to sea creatures or embryos or dividing cells. Asawa's wire sculptures seem like vivid reminders of the primordial beings, the evolutionary processes and the universal biological particles that are common to all the creatures of Earth. And in such a way, their biomorphic contours suggest the repeated forms from nature in which all humans merge as an equal kin. Thank you. I can stop share. Thank you so much, Jason. That was incredible. I think I speak for everyone that that opens up so much about Ruth Asawa's work. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about it. Thank you. <laughs> so I think um, if anyone has any questions they wanna put in the chat, um, please do. I kind of have an initial question slash thought. I was uh, hoping we could discuss um, a few things that you had shown, um, including the the Nazi imagery that we've seen um, in several student notebooks from classes with Josef Albers, um, mm -hmm. as well as the DNA structures, um, which 
I've seen later film footage of Ruth Asawa with her young students bringing in Buckminster Fuller to create paper helixes. Um, it seems wow. like That's amazing. This, it's amazing. Um, it seems like this research taps into, um, of course, Ruth's own self-motivation with this, but it also seems to tap into a larger discussion that was happening at Black Mountain College at the time, um, which was of course so formative for her. Um, so I guess the question that comes out of that is, you know, thinking about Ruth's trajectory as an educator and her trajectory in life, um, wondering how these concepts seem to evolve over time um, and how she kind of made them even more so her own um, as her life progressed. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, Kate, and so interesting. I really want to see and um, the 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 helix paper experiment. That sounds fantastic, and so Black Mountain College. I mean, you're like, it's it's a fabulous question, and I think it like hits the nail on the head for me also. And I think it gestures to the stakes of you know this presentation is a very particular kind of um, meditation on Asawa. But the broader stakes um, for our history are absolutely those that biomorphism um, doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? This is exactly a moment um, at Black Mountain College when these educators and brilliant artists like Albers and Fuller are thinking about how form connects to these um, to these larger principles of equality and um, and democracy and, you know, so there's this kind of, um, there's there's both a very particular case study for Asawa in terms of her life and, and the cell. And then there's also this larger discussion to be had about what the stakes are for biomorphism. And my last point about that is, you know, like if you think, I, I'm really interested in UNESCO, for example, and their headquarters in Paris which was like commissioned right after this. And it's so interesting to think about UNESCO and this kind of post-World War II moment when there was this exigency around declaring equality and what was the form that UNESCO took? What was the form of the building? What was the form of their art collection in the building? It was this biomorphic, you know, Isamunaguchi, like Calder, right? So what is it that these, um, this kind of quote unquote formalism or the biomorphic biomorphism, what does that have to do then with equality and democracy is very interesting. Mm -hmm. We have um, a great question um, from Helen Molesworth. Um, Helen, okay. would you like to ask your question aloud or would you like for me to read your question? Um, you could put that in the chat or you could unmute yourself. Hi everybody, Jason, that was really great. There are workmen outside my house drilling, which is why I'm muted. So I'm just gonna let the questions stand in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you, Helen. So the question that Helen writes, um, I'm curious how your very convincing biological reading works with the other quality of Asawa's work, which is about dance, namely the idea that some of her first lobed shapes lobe shaped drawings happened when watching and participating in Merce Cunningham's dance classes and practices. Yeah, um, thank you, Helen, for, for the amazing question. And um, I, that that is, real. I think it's really, really important. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot happening at precisely this time around the question of how speech and movement as a form of speech gestures to, again, equality, universal, equality, universal, universalisms in general. And I'm referring in this moment to um, actually like even Fred Moten, the scholar Fred Moten's work about this question of, um, you know, glossolalia, for example, and, um, you know, uh, how, how s seemingly abstract forms, you know, whether that's glossolalia in speech or modern dance vis-a-vis -vis Merce Cunningham or um, biomorphism via Asawa, how, did, how does this form 
gesture to a universal, basically a divine is what I'm seeing, you know, and it, it's of a piece, like it would be so cool to have a second chapter in this non-book book that would be about Merce Cunningham and like, well, you know, what is the, what is the universal language of dance in that moment and how does it relate to the larger questions and stakes that formalism is posing at this time? So I love that connection. Um, another question um, that has come in from Renee. Um, I'll read the question aloud and Renee, if you'd like to elaborate, um, you are welcome to. Can you speak to Ruth's use of wire as material, being able to see the inside and outside of the work and the universality concept? Yeah, that's a great question also. Um, I, you know, I gave this, um, as like a kind of a practice talk at Berkeley. And, um, you know, a, a mentor of mine was like, yeah, but what about the fact that wire is not a very organic thing? You know, and it was, I think it's a really good question. And, um, and it's a complication to this reading, I think. On the other hand, I like thinking of them as modular, you know, or as uh, not modular, but as models, right? So like, you know, we, when, and so in, and try to represent something, it's like Kant, right? There's always a distant analogy. It's always a representation, you know? My parents were chemists, my dad was a chemist and like all these models are made out of plastic and these really organ inorganic, you know, or they're organic, but anyways, unnatural things that then are representing this, um, these biological materials. So I think it's okay. I think it's interesting to think about the metal as as, as merely the material of the model and it's a representation. And the only other thing I'll say about that is um, when I realized that the spool that Asawa was using was like actually literally getting rewoven into a double helix, I was just like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we need to go with that. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That was, it's really interesting too that she transforms metal into something that looks soft. So you have that idea of hard and soft. So thank yeah, you, this great presentation, fabulous. Thanks, yeah. Um, and I think that goes back also to um, Helen's point about um, Merce, Cunning Merce Cunningham and you know, looking at dance and making, translating somehow and possibly translating dance into form and this question of how do these different media communicate? And one of the answers is through this kind of magical um, metamorphosis that's made possible only by art, right? That like, yes. you know, um, you know, this it's synesthesia, right? It's the translation of music into physical material of hard into soft and vice versa. And all these contradictions ultimately are are the point, right? They don't get resolved. It's just the contradiction itself, which um, gestures to the higher stakes, the universal stakes. And it, Thank you. I think a natural place to go from there, um, seeing a few things come in about um, the idea of shadow um, and Ruth's work always kind of creating this duality when it's exhibited of the piece itself and then the shadow that it creates. Um, mm -hmm. and of course, thinking about Ruth, knowing that that's probably extremely intentional. Um, I was just curious how that um, fed into your research and your understanding of her work. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Hammond Tower lobby of the Young Museum where she has her permanent installation. And um, actually when I first saw the works, I had no idea who Ruth Asawa was. Like I just was a first year graduate student I had no idea, just to be completely honest. And I was in that space and I was just completely spellbound by um, these shadows and the light and the way that they're diffused through this diaphanous metal material. And all, like I said, like all these contradictions. And um, one of the things that really fascinates me about the shadow is um, how, and I, and I thought about this, you know, how the shadow um, is almost another representation. It's like another, it's a duplicate. So I think about like the silhouette, right? So if her sculptures are about reproduction, like cellular reproduction, so this doubling or this dripping, like one cell becomes two, then the shadow in a way is another cell, 
or another representation or another replication. And so these infinite replications, even at the level of the shadow, are constantly gesturing to this universalism that we're bathed in, which in that scenario is light, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question um, from Kim regarding, um, I'm just, Kim, I'm sorry, I'm going to kind of condense this um, into um, kind of just a question about um, Ruth's trips uh, with the Albers um, to Mexico and mm -hmm. her experiences with um, the woven baskets there. Um, and um, if you could just kind of speak to that within this kind of evolution. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a lot there. And um, I, I actually, in an earlier version of this, got really interested in Annie and Joseph because um, you know, they made many, many trips to Mexico and were kind of avid collectors of, of um, basically like indigenous Mexican um, um, art uh, and craft and um, craft. And I think there's a big um, question there. There's a lot to say about that. It's really problematic, right? There's these questions of tourism and, and, and indigeneity and um, the kind of colonizing gaze of these um, like brilliant um, American artists in Mexico. So, you know, I think there's that connection. And then how does that connect to craft and to the basket, which is where Asawa started? I would love to think more deeply about that. I don't know how to talk about that yet. There's a lot there. But I do think it is significant that it starts with the basket. And I'll just quickly say, you know, learning that technique from villagers, and it's an egg basket, right? So that's the other thing is like, if these represent eggs in some way, I mean, maybe that's too literal, but in any case, it's an egg basket. But I think it's important that it starts with the basket because I think um, part of the point is that all of us, right? Like all of us as creatures and cells, we're not open. Like we're closed. We're, we're, we're sealed off. And we're also perfectly like Asawa sculptures, we're not sealed off, right? We're diaphanous. We have these orifices and we, our skin breathes, right? We get acupuncture, we like <laughs> get surgery. We like, you know, so no, we're not, we're not sealed. We're not pure containers. And so I think I'm not claiming that Asawa's works represent the body per se, but I do think that this question of of starting with the basket, which is open and not biological, and the discovery of closure, that, bio, that, that life is sealed and then also diaphanous is a really important point. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Gwen um, that of course we love here at BMCMAC. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how the environment at Black Mountain College facilitated her ability to transpose the scientific concepts within her artwork so completely. Yeah, um, again, there's, that's a great question. There's a lot there and, it, and it, it also gestures back to Helen's question and this, these questions of synesthesia, which are, I think are huge at Black Mountain at this time um, in general or in the ethers anyways. I think specifically about, um, Asawa's uh, participation in a class with the mathematician Max Den. Um, they used to take these like um, walks in the woods and Den used to like talk about fractals and trees and like all the like incredible geometry of the world. And like, I think that it was a place where you know, obviously it was a place where the silos weren't there between these disciplines, but it was more than interdisciplinarity. I think it was an interest in transcendence to some degree. And um, that's just my take, you know, that, and that kind of, that transcendence is possible through math, you know, in the chink of, a, of, the, of the angle that where a, a tree branch meets its trunk is the infinite philosophy of like equality or love or, you know, that the mathematician could somehow then become the romantic who takes a walk in the woods. That's very interesting. Yeah, I love, because it's so Black Mountain to think of, you know, of course everyone thinks of Black Mountain for the arts, but I think what made it such fertile ground for artists was the ability to dive into concepts of biology and mathematics and physics um, 
thinking about Ruth and then also thinking about Dorothea Rockburn. Um, so there's this tradition there, um, which again, this research does so much to open up doors to. Um, before I pose what, looking at time, might be our last question, I wanna um, just voice, um, Addie Lanier has um, put a quote into our chat, um, a quote from Ruth Asawa. I am able to take a wire and go into the air and define the air without stealing from anyone. A line can enclose and define space while letting the air remain air, which I think is just an incredibly gentle, beautiful reminder of um, Ruth's approach and this kind of holistic um, yeah. way that she approached her artwork. Um, um, I love that. And it makes me think of just quickly dark, it makes me think of like dark matter and um, how, you know, we're all these solid biological life forms that are also like completely, we're just air. <laughs> like we're like 90% unknown dark matter. <laughs> Nobody knows what we are. I think I maybe I'm not a scientist. Maybe I'm getting that wrong, but I know that there's there's more of us that is not solid, right? And so yeah, I love that too. That's fabulous. The substance of air, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is um this is a, a question that I'm kind of condensing from several questions um, regarding this kind of meeting ground of you know Ruth is coming to Black Mountain College after internment. Um, so she has experienced a uh, very American form of eugenics and discrimination. Um, and then coming into an environment that has been fostered by refugees um, and their experiences, um, and then finding Black Mountain College in many ways through that. Um, and this kind of convergence of experience is something that a lot of people are drawing out. Um, so I know you mentioned in the beginning um, her kind of speaking on her time in internment, um, but I wondered if in your research you found anything about, you know, what being a Black Mountain and being around um, those who had fled Germany and fled the Bauhaus and who had experienced um, their own version of this discrimination, um, if that kind of convergence is something that she spoke on. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great question, and I don't know um, very much about that, and actually didn't really think of it um, until, you, until you're synthesizing beautifully all these points made by audience members, which is really interesting. Um, I didn't think too much about it, you know, I, but, but, but it, in a way, that's, impo that's really important, just, uh, just, I'm just off the cuff, like, yeah, you know, the, the UNESCO statement on race, um, is, is being issued, you know, the year after she makes her breakthrough sculpture, um, you know, is a response to World War II. I mean, one interesting thought is to think about Albers and, you know, all these um, people who flee, who um, arrive in this harbor of Black Mountain, is to think about, like, I wonder if there's an interesting way to think about Black Mountain as a response mm -hmm. itself, you know, as a response to the precarity um, of, of World War II, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that's a, I think that's a little, I'm, well, I don't know the time, the timelines, but in any case, um, there may be something there. Um, I think for Asawa, my, um, there, there was a lot um, in the in the article that you know I did not bring today that has to do with the way that Asawa's work was received by critics, and there's been great scholarship already written about that that I draw from. Um, but it's um, you know it's it's hard. It's there was a lot of racialization of her work. Um, there was a lot of pegging it and essentializing it. Um, so I think you know. It's not just internment, although that was huge. You know, there was a there was a lot um, that that I think was putting external pressure on um, her her declarations of being a universal being. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think we um, we had a quote from Ruth in our Women of Black Mountain College show, um, essentially saying, you know, she she's like gallerists don't know what my work is, critics don't know what my work is, but I'm just gonna keep doing the work, um, which, you know, she had that tenacity to her. Um, 
but before we wrap up, um, is there anything that we didn't touch on um, that you want to make sure that we can include before we wrap up for the day? If not, then that's fine. I think you touched on a lot. <laughs> All right, so I think we have a lot of questions that we will not have the time today to answer, but I do want to let everybody know, um, we've seen a few people kind of coming in and out, um, that today's talk is going to be, it has been recorded and has been archived and will be available um, on our Museum from Home page, our YouTube channel, um, and on our Instagram um, within 24 hours. Um, so you'll be able to come and catch up on anything that you missed. Um, but I want to thank everybody for being here, and especially I want to thank you, Jason, for bringing this to us. It's the most enlightening lunch break that I've had in a long time, so thank you. <laughs> no, thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak about her work, and thanks to everybody for the incredible questions. And yeah, a perfect lunch break for me, too. <laughs> it was super fun. Yeah, thank you. Fabulous. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope to keep in touch. Uh, we'll have more programs coming up soon. Um, but everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Kate. Thanks. Bye, everyone.